Awesome. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Dyslexia Coffee Talk. It's January 23rd or 2023, and we're going to start off the year with Dr. Louisa Motes. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. My pleasure. Your work is so essential to our community and what parents are um, doing, advocating for their children and, you know, changing the science of reading and clarify. I mean, it's just the list of what you have created is just absolutely boundless. And um, one of one of my key passions that I think people kind of don't talk about a lot, and you've got a whole book about it, <laughs> is uh, the writing aspect, um, the speech to print. And um, I have your, I have your book. I should have it down here to like show everybody. I apologize for that, but um, I was wondering if you could shed some light on the importance of reading and writing instruction going hand in hand. Yeah. Well, um, first of all. Uh... You know, there, there are many influences on the way I think, uh, and I, I, over many years, I mean, I'm now 78 years old, believe it or not, so no, I've had I a very know. long career, <laughs> and uh, I know I, some people don't think I look it, but I tell you, it's very real to me. Um, uh, I've been really fortunate to be educated from various um, experiences that are a little bit unusual in my field. Some people, um, you know, are trained in a certain branch of this and function in a certain branch of our enterprise here, which is recognizing and doing something about dyslexia on all fronts and, uh, and reading education in general. Um, the way that I became aware of the importance of including writing in assessment and instruction was uh, first of all as a clinician and seeing how um, uh, the, the role of written expression in the academic development of kids so that I saw some kids who had severe dysgraphia who were able to read fairly well many kids who were poor readers who were of course poor writers and I had a particular interest um, by the time my graduate program came along after after being a teacher and a clinician for 10 years uh, I had a particular interest in understanding spelling because that was a very neglected area and it seemed to me so puzzling that Spelling was treated as if it should be something simple and easy. You just, you know, a teacher just sends home the list on Monday. Parents are supposed to practice with their kids at home. Kid comes back on Friday and is supposed to have memorized a bunch of words. And obviously the learning process wasn't working like that. And the kids who had trouble reading, of course, were having more trouble with spelling, but also spelling and writing could exist as problems unto themselves. And then I observed that um, in all settings, the evaluation of spelling and writing tended to be non-existent or very secondary. Um, and then uh, in our research project, the big research project, um, $10 million of NIH money, um, where we we did intervention in Houston, as it turned out, where you are, and um, Washington D.C., where where I was, uh, we did a study of um, what teachers were doing in writing instruction, which was almost nothing. We did professional development and writing, and discovered through that process that teachers had no training in how to teach writing, and also had very few appropriate or you know, instructional materials and the teaching of writing was being um, treated like uh, an art, according to Lucy Calkins, instead of a practice that could be informed by research. And then in those years, I also became much more 
uh, or my understanding of the theoretical um, basis for what we were doing was much deeper. And I really paid attention to those few researchers who were studying writing and giving us some theoretical frameworks out of research. By, by the way, you know, it drives me nuts when people say something or other is just a theory. Well, a theory by definition is developed from scientific investigation. It is, con it is an understanding of a phenomenon that is generated from scientific study. So that's what a theory is to me. So we had people like Virginia Berninger um, really investigating the relationship between dyslexia and dysgraphia, um, doing studies of kids with dysgraphia. Um, and uh, she, she had a major influence on all of our understanding of this. Um, in the meantime, um, as my work has focused for the last 20 years on teacher education through letters professional development, uh, mainly teacher education in general, uh, while we labor to get across the science of reading <laughs> as we're in the middle of this right now, um, it doesn't seem to be any room to talk about the role of writing. Uh, but what our research continues to tell us is that reading and writing are intricately related in, in literacy development, mm -hmm. that one affects the other, uh, each are related, there, there are uh, cognitive and linguistic underpinnings for each that are the same. So for example, the role of phonology and learning to spell is even more prominent and we've known this for decades. Uh, no one does anything about it, so we still have the few spelling programs that are out there still have nothing about phonological awareness mm -hmm. or specifically phoneme awareness the way we like to teach it. Um, so uh, it's it's a big problem. And if, um, if we can't get to first base with reading, then, uh, you know, it seems, um, you know, like a bigger task to try to get across a more comprehensive view of literacy development. And when I use that term, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's funny because I'm coming full circle around to using the term that people use who are really out of a kind of whole language constructivist framework. Mm -hmm. And they talk about literacy as if it were this sort of undefinable global thing of making sense no matter what the medium and so the process of learning actually learning to use the sim alphabetic symbol system by which we represent language that's that's not of interest <laughs> but as I'm using the term I mean the relationship between spoken language reading and writing specifically um I have two specific questions on that, on what you just said. Um, quick comment, you know, as the parent of a child who is both dyslexic and dysgraphic, you know, it seemed like all of the stress and the lack of knowledge that we had, of course, all of the stress was to focus on the reading. I found it very, very difficult. And we were several years down the road before I could really get any answers about what to do about dysgraphia. Um, I couldn't really find any information on it. Uh, of course, you know, the information on reading is overwhelming, but there seemed to be less out there specifically about the writing. But two, there was a learning curve for me in figuring out how to find that as well. Mm -hmm. um, have, you, have you succeeded in finding any resources? I, I have, I have definitely started to, um, you know, I got to listen to a lecture given by Dr. Brenda Taylor out of um, one of the Texas A&M campuses. Uh, she did, uh, she actually, her, this lecture is recorded by Nye House and it's available free on YouTube, but it's called Dysgraphia is More Than Messy Handwriting. Yeah. Okay, good. It's about an hour long and it's an I recommend it to everybody when I see questions about dysgraphia come up because it's just su such an informative session. Mm -hmm. And of course I have your book, 
uh, which to me is a Bible. I've taken uh, teaching written expression, um, scaffolding that instruction from the landmark school through, through their professional development. Um, Very good. There's, there's sources out there. I, I hope that more get developed. Um, in my opinion, I feel like within the education system, the, the ability to teach writing is something that's almost extinct. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I find that very frustrating. But my first question is, I was really, really fortunate enough to get to interview William Van Cleve about a month before he passed away. Mm -hmm. And we talked specifically about dysgraphia. And one of the things he said was he felt like dysgraphia was a really big bucket that a lot of things were kind of being thrown into. And some kids were being thrown into the bucket that weren't dysgraphic, they just never had proper instruction. But then, you know, you truly had the dysgraphic kids, but then dysgraphia, just like dyslexia, you know, there's a couple of different ways in which you may be dysgraphic. Um, you've got the graphomotor piece, like my son has terrible handwriting, terrible handwriting. <laughs> Um, but he also has that disconnect where he, you know, he's extremely loquacious. I mean, gosh, if I brought him down here, he could talk your ear off for the next 12 hours about the video game he's playing right now with incredible detail and description and just endlessly. And he'll never stop talking, but he can't put that on paper. Mm -hmm. at all. And he told me once he was like, mom, first I have to think about my handwriting. And then I have to think about my spelling, mm -hmm. which he's very insecure about. He spells better than he thinks that he does, but his spelling is still poor, despite all of the remediation that he's had on reading. Um, and then he has to think about what he's actually going to write. And by the time he physically puts the pen to paper, he's already exhausted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the question I guess is what do you think about William's comment overall that dysgraphia is kind of a big bucket and how do we get to what our children really need? Mm -hmm. Well, we get to it by understanding the components or, or what goes into production of the written word. And it's very complicated. And uh, there, there's, uh, I think in terms of an analogy to the simple view of reading where we have these two components, word recognition and language comprehension that are qualitatively different and require different approaches to assessment and instruction and have known relationships with one another throughout development. Well, the writing means you have to have some mastery of the symbol system and to be able to produce it motorically. And that requires a connection between the brain and the hand and uh, uh, motor feedback and sensory motor uh, perception and re remembering uh, motor habits. Uh, it also requires being able to spell. Being able to spell is somewhat independent of being able to actually handwrite. Um, there is uh, the problem of using a keyboard <laughs> and the relationship between that and writing. So there's the uh, symbolic production aspect of writing, but writing also requires um, a, a lot of, um, we call it a mental juggling act because there's so many cognitive components involved in producing the written word. You have to hold so much in your mind as you write and as your son so aptly describes, if your limited attention capacity is being totally used up by which way does the pencil go and how do I spell this word and are my words aligned on the page, that that aspect of, of written language production, or am I, you know, can I find the letters on the keyboard? Um, it doesn't leave you a lot to think about what what is the overall organization of what I'm trying to write? What is the purpose of it? Um, what words am I going to choose? Um, uh, how do I write a sentence that makes sense? How do I link these sentences together? How do I uh, make uh, coherence between one paragraph and the next if I'm writing in paragraphs? 
how do I introduce? How do I wind it up? Is the who is my reader? Uh, what do I have to say to get my reader uh, to understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, there's a tremendous cognitive load in writing, a tremendous executive function uh, demand mm -hmm. on writing. And if kids are disfluent in their language production, either you know, getting the words on the page or thinking about and formulating the words that they need in order to express themselves, it's going to be very taxing and laborious. So what do we do about that? We think in terms of those components and chipping away, just as we do with reading, chipping away on the components in relation to one another, but building up the capacity to produce an integrated, coherent composition through a step-by-step -step process. Um, Charlie Haynes, uh, who is the wonderful, wonderful colleague and scholar who has worked with Landmark forever, has a really nice book called From Talking to Writing, where those that kind of sequence of skill building mm -hmm. in language production is laid out. Virginia Berninger uh, has written some nice summaries for the IDA in their fact sheets about um, writing by hand and writing by keyboard mm -hmm. and how it's important to learn both. Um, uh, it's And so it's a very long-term enterprise, but there are places like the Windward School in New York where Judith Hockman used to teach that developed very effective approaches for writing instruction and I walked in there a few years ago and they had a display of student writing on the walls that was just stunningly um, uh, uh, convincing to me that it is possible to take a kid, all, all, all of whom, kids, all of whom are there because they have language-based learning disabilities um, and teach them how to write. But you know, you have to have a theoretical framework. You have to have an idea of these component skills, if you will, and you have to skillfully chip away at them in a very systematic way over time. Yeah. Um, I've taken Landmark's professional development course on teaching writing instruction, and they used the book from talking to writing. In fact, I can see it sitting three feet away from me over there. Um, what I, one of the things that I found interesting about the course itself was they didn't go sequentially in the book. They actually kind of skipped around within the book as they kind of talked about the, it was more from a syntactical approach, I think, um, you know, the kernel sentence. And so you needed to understand the nouns and the verbs. And then they were talking about where and when statements. And so they started to bring in adjectives and adverbs, and then they did prepositions, but prepositions was kind of, or they started talking about prepositions at least kind of early before they kind of got to talking about more of what the prepositional phrase was. So it wasn't this concept that was withheld until later within the structure of sentence building, if mm -hmm. you will. Um, but I love the graphic organizers that are in that book. I, <laughs> um, I actually, through in my advocacy for my own child, um, they actually agreed to send this year's ELA teacher, English language arts teacher, to that same professional development course. Mm -hmm. So she took it before the school year began. And all of his graphic organizers are out of that book and or their modified version of one of the graphic organ, like he has, he has one for science specifically because it's numerous part questions. So we took one of the graphic organizers and we modified it slightly in order to be able to plug and play what he needed to do with uh, science. So <laughs> I found that very helpful. Good. Uh, but the second question that I had based on the first thing that you said was you brought up letters, which huge fan of letters. If I had my druthers, every teacher would be trained in letters. Um, I, I was wondering if you could give sort of a, a broad overview of what specifically letters is for teachers, because I, 
with the programs that are out there, I think that there's a lot of questions sort of, you know, what should I get trained in or, and the various programs that exist, like, but I think most of the programs that exist are kind of more from a remediation thought process instead of an overall, here's how you can teach all children, which I feel letters is more of thought of that way than necessarily maybe the other programs are. So I, I, in general, like letters versus Orton-Gillingham. I think people think of Orton-Gillingham as more of a remediation when it's, does that make sense? <laughs> I think that's pretty accurate. Um, I've just written an article that's going to be published in the AFT journal, American Educator, describing what letters is, where it came <laughs> from, what our intentions are with letters. So that should be out pretty soon. Um, but the the goal is to give teachers a grounding in a few very well validated scientific frameworks for understanding what needs to go into instruction. Mm -hmm. So theoretical framework for what goes into word recognition, a theoretical framework for what goes into reading comprehension as a whole. Um, a theoretical framework for understanding reading and, and early spelling development, mainly based on Linnea Erie and um, with references to our major cognitive psychologists and experimental psychologists who have provided us with these understandings for, you know, through five decades of meticulous scientific experimentation. And most teachers have no idea that this work exists. They haven't heard of Charles Perfetti. They haven't heard of Linnea Erie. They haven't heard of David Scheer. I mean, we, this was, you know, a very, um, uh, what should I say, kind of serendipitous aspect of, my own training that I myself went through licensing and a master's degree and everything without knowing about the scientific basis for understanding reading without having any coursework. So not until my doctorate did I learn any of these things, but then in the course of doing research with high level researchers, I became acquainted with this world of research, which is so separate from the world of educational practice. Mm -hmm. We're trying to bring these more in alignment. But anyway, um, what Letters tries to do is use these theoretical frameworks that are very well grounded, like this simple view of reading and, and Erie's developmental framework and so forth, uh, to lay out a rationale for what it is you need to assess why do you assess it? And what does that have to do with teaching? Mm -hmm. And then we do a lot with the structure of language um, because in my own research, such as it was, my own research, my personal little studies were very uh, unsophisticated surveys of teacher knowledge and things like that. But it was so clear to me that also, not only did most teachers have no familiarity with the theoretical frameworks that should be guiding everything we do, but also they don't know the content because they haven't had a chance to learn it. So uh, we teach, what are the phonemes? And we start with that. We don't start with the graphemes. We start with the phonemes because speech precedes print. Kids come to this with their speech. They mm -hmm. don't know what in the heck the letters are for. So speech is the grounding framework. We make sure teachers know what the speech sounds are, the vowel and consonant inventories. I'm talking about sounds, not letters. Letters were invented to represent them. I will die before this gets across to the world. But if you start with letters and say letters make sounds already, you're barking up the wrong tree right. because letters don't make sounds. Letters are an inadequate, uh, only partially aligned system for representing what is in speech. Furthermore, 
the English language in its written form represents meaningful parts of words or morphemes and also represents the grammatical role of words and also represents the language of origin of a word in many cases. Mm -hmm. So we take a broad view here in order to teach written language, you have to understand what language is made up of. And at the word level, it's made up of phonemes, morphemes, uh, and, and on, on the orthography, it's influenced by history, language history, uh, meaning, syntax. And if you get that as a teacher, then you have tools to draw on to explain why any word is written the way it is. So, um, and, and so our goal is to have written language make sense. And that, that's just the first part. And then the second part of letters is all about language comprehension, vocabulary, um, and what a student has to process in order to make sense of a text, what the, uh, what the lesson framework has to consider. And mm -hmm. the last unit is about teaching writing. It is um, because we can't, we don't have enough time in letters to teach all that that teachers need to know. It, it's kind of the basic, a uh, basic framework. What goes into learning to write? Here are some important things you need to know about teaching writing. And then um, a lot more needs to be done. So if if I could just say to our audience, uh, uh, if anyone is in a decision-making capacity, the knowledge base in letters is necessary, but not sufficient to get the results we want. We do not provide a curriculum for instruction. And what we do is equip people to make better choices about the tools that they're using and to understand why something like balanced literacy is so completely misconceived and off the mark. We don't want to just tell them not to do it. We want them to be armed with, you know, the same shock and horror that is in my head when I look at a leveled book mm -hmm. coming home to my kindergarten grandchild, being told to look at the pictures and guess at the words. I tell you, it took me one hour to make uh, an appointment with a curriculum director. And um, oh, the reality in the school is they don't have appropriate instructional material. So we are at a transition point here where lots of 200,000 plus teachers are going through letters and that's all great. I'm very happy about that. But I don't expect those teachers are going to be able to invent lesson after lesson of explicit systematic instruction in the concepts that we have shared with teachers through letters. That is a whole next phase of endeavor. And that has to happen or people are just going to get disillusioned. So and I, I'm glad that you said all of that because I feel like you know, in this science of reading versus balanced literacy type of discussion that tends to happen on, on various mediums, right? You see a lot of defensiveness. And one of the first things that people come out from a defensive point of view is they go, well, letters isn't a curriculum. I don't know why you're trying to support that. And from my perspective, I'm sitting here going, letters may not be a curriculum, but letters is informational to the point that it sets teachers free to teach because they understand what needs to be taught from a reading and a writing perspective and they can make those decisions and they're better able to individualize per child versus here I'm going to hand you a curriculum and I'm going to tell you how to teach it and this is what you're going to put up on your walls and I'm going to rate you on your ability to follow this A to Z. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, teaching without understanding cannot be fully intentional. It can't be fully effective. That, and so um, uh, I, 
it it well it would be good to have more research about this but the in the ideal situation we would have a teacher who had the theoretical grounding and understanding of the content that comes with letters and they would have tools for teaching that are aligned with what we're talking about mm -hmm. and they would have supportive coaching and a supportive active uh, professional learning community where the finer points were being discussed, where people gave each other feedback, where certain problems with kids would be uh, solved through uh, or, or approached through a collegial problem solving uh, effort, just mm -hmm. the way um, in, in a good clinical setting, uh, professionals from different disciplines mm -hmm. problem solve. Teachers can do that when they have, uh, and I have, I have the greatest respect and love for great teachers. And for, even for young aspiring teachers who don't know anything yet, I am so thankful they want to be teachers. I so hope they'll experience the thrill and reward of seeing a kid learn, seeing all their kids learn when they are professionally competent. And I want that to happen on a much wider scale. I want our society to appreciate how valuable a good teacher is. I mean, people pay lip service to it, but they don't come up with the salaries. They don't come up with the working conditions. They don't come up with the respect and all that. That's a whole other issue. Right. But it's a circular problem. Because when teachers flounder, because they have terrible instructional materials, terrible preparation, terrible guidance, um, they become disillusioned mm -hmm. and frustrated. I mean, my, uh, my stepdaughter-in-law is a fabulous teacher and is just getting increasingly disillusioned, but because of the working conditions. And I keep saying, don't quit, we need you. You know, we, you, you are doing so much for those kids and just keep your, keep your eye on the prize, which is those individual lives that you're affecting. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's, it's tough out there. We're, we're aware of that, but I don't think that the, you know, it's, it's again, a, a circular kind of problem. If teachers were more confident of their professional expertise and their ability to get results with all kids. And of course the kids respond and the parents see that, mm -hmm. um, then the, you know, the, the context is more ripe for improvement mm -hmm. of those things that need to be improved. So I don't know. Um, it's got to change because we're losing too many good teachers. Definitely agree. Um, so I wanted to go slightly in a different direction. And we know that balanced literacy dominates the educational space across the country. And, you know, a couple of states have made some amazing laws and you know there are people that are trying to put the effort forward. And, you know, you, you stated how many people are in the letters training right now. And um, I know two of your trainers, <laughs> one in Alabama and one in Georgia, yeah. but um, what, what sort of advice would you give to parents who want to change the system? How, cause that's a daunting task, right? I mean, first we're usually faced with, it's usually dyslexic, dyslexic parents. I think that are kind of leading that charge. Mm -hmm. you know, usually yeah. what we're dealing with first is the child hitting the wall and then how do you get the child to help? And then you're asking questions of the school district and then you wanna change your school and then you're kind of looking at your state education agency. Then you're looking at the legislation across the state. You know, you've got a state like New York where there is no legislation that exists currently that supports the science of reading or developing that in any way, shape or form. Their laws just failed. 
Um, how would how would you encourage people to start? Where does I I know it's a very broad question, but where to start? How to start? And kind of what direction would you recommend somebody to go in? I'm sorry for the very broad question. Yeah. <laughs> well, change occurs on all of those fronts. And certainly we have a number of examples of states that have changed their policies and their guidelines and even their laws because a few parents got together. Um, we saw that in Ohio, Arkansas. We just had it happen in Idaho. Idaho, my state, the very last to do anything about dyslexia. And finally, they hired me to write the dyslexia handbook, which just got adopted by the state board in December. And now we're in the process of now trying to educate teachers without any funding. So here we go. But that whole effort was led by parents in decoding dyslexia um, who have suffered with the malpractice and misunderstanding for, you know, a, a long time. Um, so we, we get states to move, but we also have at the school level, just say you don't want to fight the state. You want to get something to happen at the school level. I would say, first of all, do your homework, really study what the IDA has to offer, the Reading League, as far as regular classroom instruction. The Reading League is an outstanding resource. Everything they do, I'm a strong supporter of that. Look at, um, I would stay away from social media. I mean, there's just so much noise in there. Um, the reliable sources, decoding dyslexia, is really good on um, coaching parents how to approach things. I mean, short of, of uh, due process, okay, you just, in your parent conference, I would start with saying, what are your objectives mm -hmm. in your instruction? Um, do you have a blueprint for your instruction? Mm -hmm. How does that align with your instructional materials? How do you know what the appropriate next steps for students in your classroom are? And of course, in the lower grades, those steps have everything to do with word recognition, building basic word recognition or decoding skills. Um, uh, those, those goals will have to do with phoneme awareness, decoding skills and word recognition and spelling as the other side of that coin. And of course, that depends on letter formation, being able to produce the written word. Mm -hmm. um, and then at an you know oral language level, they should be looking at things like, can the child retell a simple story? But you want to say, what are your goals? Mm -hmm. Because it's so common to have teachers be filling up the day with stuff, activities that keep kids busy, and there's a cute little take-a-home puppet or something or other, but the parent doesn't know, okay, what is my kid supposed to be able to do here in January of kindergarten or first grade? And is my kid on track? And how do you know that? Geez, in the <laughs> granddaughter school, the teacher literally is a substitute teacher, but literally sent home a practice sheet telling parents in December to rehearse their kids on the assessment so that when the assessment was given, it would look like the kids were learning. I mean, this is just inappropriate. Mm -hmm. It's inappropriate. Yeah. And, it, and it comes from the teacher not having a curriculum mm -hmm. that she can count on that is laid out in a step-by-step -step way, the progression through these early skills that's going to make a tremendous difference for these little kids. Because what do we know from research that is incontrovertible is that the earlier we catch them, the earlier we intervene, the earlier we do the right stuff with kids, the better the outcomes. And we should if we do this job really well, by the end of first grade, have no more than five or 6% of kids who are below basic. And I just saw a wonderful presentation yesterday by a scientist who summarized 
all the evidence on direct instruction, big D-I, where literally the, the, the figure of the proportion of kids who would be below basic if systematic instruction, well implemented, was done over a long enough period, it would be 6% of the population, not 34% or 32% that we have now. Mm-hmm. So um, this is urgent. To me, the urgency is getting the focus on teaching. And teaching is not easy. It's a complex enterprise. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to do, I mean, there's there's an artistic, humanistic element to it. But it's very, um, you have to be analytical. One of my com- one of my colleagues yesterday in a seminar I attended uh, had a kind of radical suggestion, and it was this: it was okay if we can't expect kindergarten teachers to come in being able to do what I'm talking about, because they are expecting to do puppets and they are expecting to embrace their kids with love and warmth and support and cookies and, you know, and that's really important. Um, And they are going to sit around and read wonderful stories and clap and sing songs. Okay, good. We want that. So if the kindergarten teacher has not been trained to have the expertise to actually teach the reading component, why don't we have a cadre of teachers who are analytical, who want to learn how to do this, and who will go from one classroom to the next, three in a row, doing this instruction. Mm -hmm. And maybe we call it small DI, small direct instruction. It's systematic, explicit, it follows a scope and sequence, it goes through the linguistic elements that kids have to learn, and on the other side of it, they, they have learned how to read. Mm-hmm. We can, it, it, the job can be done. You know, <laughs> we know we have to do the job. We know the job can be done. And the real issue is having enough teachers trained to do it with the right kind of tools and then mm-hmm. setting up our system so that every kid gets the advantage of this kind of instruction. Right. Um, I'm definitely in that bucket with you. I've been asking for, I mean, of course I can go to my state education website and download what the state standards are, right? Well, they're useless. Exactly. In in a classroom, month by month, week by week. But what did you go for this week? Where are you headed? Uh, What what does this week's lesson have to do with where you want to be in six weeks? And I asked that question for years. Okay. Simply met with stairs. Well, it's because it's more evasion thinking, right? Right. Yeah. (laughs) I found it very frustrating. I'm like, how do you, why are you refusing to tell me? Well, I think, you know, I think it's, it's not just, and this is something I've come to understand. Mm -hmm. It's, 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 it's lack of knowledge. It's lack of an understanding of how the structure of language can be taught in a sequential way. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you get to something like syntax, forget it. I mean, most teachers, this is what, where my, my personal research comes in. Um, A teacher, we did a survey and in that study in DC, when we were studying writing question, multiple choice, what is a sentence? Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and the the most often the the highest response was it begins with a capital and ends with a period next most frequent response it's a complete thought only 25% identified it's it has to have a subject and a predicate mm-hmm. and that's the right answer in right. case anyone is wondering a sentence has a subject and a predicate. Sometimes the subject is implied that it has to have a subject and a predicate. Mm -hmm. And if you, and it has to have a, definitely has to have a predicate if the subject is implied as with a command. Right. But, um, you know, if the teacher doesn't know that, then you go into the classroom and 
how's the teacher getting kids to write? She's putting four lines on the board and she's saying capital has to go here in the beginning and a period has to go in the end. Put four words. That's a sentence. Yeah. yeah. And that's that's the kind of writing instruction that we would see. Yeah, I, I remember it was a fifth grade IEP meeting and um, they wanted a goal was presented for beginning the sentence with a capital letter and ending the sentence with the proper punctuation. That was the goal. And I went, oh, I'm curious, why are you proposing this as a goal? And, you know, they started talking about his inability to write, you know, in various things. They were giving various examples. And I said, have you ever taught him what a noun is? And they went, um, no. And I said, and what, what, what do you think his, his grasp of what a noun is? How, how, how well do you think that is? And they went, I don't think he understands what a noun is. And I said, okay, how about a verb? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and then I went, where in the Texas educational um, state standards, in what grade is a noun and a verb supposed to be taught in? And they said that's supposed to be mastered in second grade. And I said, then how is he in fifth grade making a B in English language arts? And he doesn't understand what a noun and a verb is. And you want to give me a goal with a that he's going to begin his sentences with capital letters and end his sentences with proper punctuation. You haven't taught him syntax or grammar. Mm -hmm. So this goal is inappropriate. <laughs> right. Right on. That's right. Okay. So back to parents. Yeah. Parents are going to be more open to coaching on things like this and receptive because they will recognize that their kids aren't progressing and they'll recognize that their kids are totally confused about language structure, beginning with speech sounds, but extending to not only sentence structure, but also how in the heck you put a paragraph together, let alone an essay. And if you, um, and, and this, this is always to me the puzzling thing, why do parents see this more readily than the educators? And, you know, that I really don't have a good answer for other than education culture has been infected for so long with fuzzy thinking about what goes into learning to read and write. Mm -hmm. um, you just see, you see it in the workshops, you see it in the written materials, you see it in the curricular choices you see it in the way uh the reports are mm -hmm. written yeah you see it in um uh curriculum guidelines you, you see it's, it's all it's everywhere um do we have do we know what the statistic is of how um, college level freshmen how many how many how many students are accepted into college they enter as freshmen of course and then from acceptance how many of that what percentage of that is pushed into a remedial reading and writing course because they don't have the right they, they may read very well but they don't have the writing skills because i know that there's been a lot of dialogue that the professors at the university level are very frustrated because their students can't write Mm -hmm. And as point of interest, um, like I, my undergraduate, I got from the University of Houston. I was actually an English major and their English college is one of the best English colleges in the country. Mm -hmm. It's part of their creative writing program, mm -hmm. which was tied for Johns Hopkins for second. <laughs> Iowa mm -hmm. was first. Um, but I looked up prior to my last IEP meeting, I went and looked up English 101, they don't call it English 101 anymore, but I wanted to see what an English 101 writing requirement was. And it was a 3000 word essay with perfect grammar and syntax. And so my question, and it wasn't just for my IEP meeting, but I wanted to ask the question overall of the district, of the school, of, of everybody. I'm like, what are you doing to enable our children to be able to write a 3000 word essay with perfect grammar and syntax? Good question. 
You know, I, I like you, I'm aware that um, m- many um, college professors, or just through the grapevine or whatever articles I read, are very frustrated with the poor incoming skills mm-hmm. of their students. And many of them need to go through um, a remedial class. Um, I know that in places like community colleges, uh, where uh, the population tends to come from schools that are under-resourced, you know, and kids who have less support at home and that kind of thing, mm-hmm. that the problem is particularly bad. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's just, it, by the time students get that far, it's too late to really mm-hmm. uh, really accomplish that objective that that you just cited. You may be able to improve the quality of the writing so that they would be employable, mm-hmm. um, but uh, you know. You just wonder when is our society going to wake up and realize that good use of language, spoken and written, mm-hmm. is essential for navigating in the more demanding and rigorous and competitive fields of of enterprise, mm-hmm. academic or business or or otherwise. Um, and it's always been that way, mm-hmm. right? Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know what what doctor would have somebody in the reception office um, who couldn't send out an email or write up a office report or something. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it's I don't get it. But I'm saying I'm saying these rather even this is what gets me that what I'm saying is considered controversial. Uh because so. <laughs> yeah, it's just I just live in the real world. Right. I live in the real world of uh seeing who who's employed where. Mm-hmm. And, uh what happens when you know people make mistakes of grammar, of spelling, punctuation that go uncorrected, and how in the real world there are consequences for that inadequate education? Absolutely. One of the things that I find interesting too is. Um, like I've had all of that education. I, I am a skilled writer and, but even I can make mistakes because I'm human, right? We're all going to make mistakes sometimes. And I don't have anybody that can proofread my stuff for me. And the mistake that I make is I almost need to walk away from something for a month and read it cold. If I'm going to catch all of my mistakes and word only catches so much as well. Right. right. And I'll go back and I'll read something cold later that i published and I'm like oh my gosh I've got some grammatical mistakes but then some people will like pounce on me and go you made grammatical mistakes I can't believe that you published that this is all in my advocacy life not in my professional life because I feel like if I've not put a comma in an email I'm not pounced on for that in my professional life But for some reason in this advocacy world, it's like people are happy to jump on top of me if I've made a grammatical mistake. And I'm sitting here going, okay, please take that passion and let's turn it toward the education system because our children need to understand grammar. and They they need an attitude adjustment. That too. (laughs) A little more kind and saying, um, uh, by the way, did you know that X, Y, Z? Exactly. I, I do that once in a while, always with some hesitation, but mm-hmm. I can't stand it. You yeah. know, it's whether you use an apostrophe and it's or not. I mean, it's like, okay, 
It's not that hard. I'm pretty good at uh, commas where, where I tend to get a little confused sometimes are, se are semicolons. And well, so, sure. you know, nobody knows how to use a semicolon. What the heck? <laughs> I know. <laughs> But I did want to ask you one more question, which you stated this earlier, which there's such a disconnect between um, educational research and the teaching practice itself. And I can't remember who I heard state kind of a, an analogy or not an analogy per se, but it was a statement years ago that it, they found it entertaining because the buildings are right across from each other on the university campus, but it's like the one doesn't know that the other exists. And they were talking about the practice side, not the educational research side. Why do you feel that there is such a profound disconnect? Because in all of the babble that happens in the, in the debate within this war, right? A lot of the work that is done by you and by your peers is dismissed because oh, they've never been in a classroom, which isn't true for a lot of you, specifically you, but it's it's like there's this, they don't know what they're talking about. We do because we're every day in the classroom. And again, I'm not teacher bashing. I'm talking about sort of the, the tone as a whole. Why, why does this disconnect exist? And do you have any thoughts on potentially how we can bridge that? Well, I've been thinking about this for decades and um, uh, I mean, some people, I mean, some people who write about this in, in education or the rejection of it's kind of the hard sciences uh, in the world of education go back to constructivist theorizing, especially in the 1920s and so on, and how those ideas took hold in schools of education and schools of education have been uh, allowed to do function independent of the other more rigorous sciences that could be um, working in partnership with them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and schools of education generally uh, draw from the humanities um, and not the sciences. True. Um, I think maybe a start. Well, there, there are a couple of model programs out there where these worlds are being brought together. And one is the college, uh, um, sorry, Mount St. Joseph's University and their new, newish doctoral program in the science of reading. And everybody who goes in there has a history as a practitioner and is functioning as a practitioner. Mm -hmm. And the goal is not to come out of there being an experimental researcher, but the goal is to have these people with deep experience in the classroom and or clinic learn uh, to read research, not to do research as such, or if they do research, it it's research that's going to be using um, methodologies that um, maybe cross these fields. So qualitative and quantitative, um, and that uh, inform the studies or they use their understanding of what the real questions are to design research that's going to be meaningful to practitioners using the talents of methodologists and statisticians who know how to pin numbers on something mm -hmm. and and glean evidence of one kind or another. So that's very promising and we need more programs like that. And there's some other places where that kind of cross-disciplinary work goes on. We need to pay more attention to those places and those entities that are doing that kind of work. Um, the South, Southeast Regional Lab um, 
uh, Wes Hoover worked there for a while and he's written one of the best books as a cognitive psychologist with a deep understanding of what the implications of the of laboratory work is for practice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, those are really good resources and we just have to train educators to know where to look if they're not part of these enterprises, to know which enterprises they can trust for guidance because <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, well, I don't know. I, I, I do know that these are worlds apart. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was involved in, <laughs> in this complex study in Washington with the very best methodologist and statisticians in the country, you know, Jack Fletcher, Barbara Foreman, Dave Francis, guiding the work we were doing in classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, I realized that, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, for the first 12, 15 years of my existence in the field, I had no clue what they were doing, where these sites were, what the studies were, where they were published, what books to read. No, so I was living that dichotomy. And at the same time, understanding when I was in the education world, how dumbed down everything was, how frustrating and dissatisfying and my master's program, oh my God, you know, I got out of there not having a clue how to teach, but it went into teaching, mm -hmm. looking helplessly at the kids who couldn't read uh, mm -hmm. in front of me. Mm -hmm. um, live through that i don't know it could go on for a long time I'm not sure i'm adding much to the discussion no i think i think you've made some great points um i'll share with you you know i i have a family member who's currently a teacher and she did her master's in education and she had an assignment due uh, but they her and her family were at my house for for dinner and the kids were swimming in the pool and um, but she had an assignment. She needed to get it finished and turned in by like eight o'clock that night. And so she took a break between everybody swimming outside and dinner happening to, to work on her assignment. <laughs> One of her children is dyslexic as well. And she called me over and had me read some of the questions that she was having to answer. Um, she did, I mean, she's not asking me for help. She just wanted me to see some of the questions and the answer choices. And I was dumbfounded is, is the kindest word that I can come up with. Um, and I was just, I, I read about three or four questions and I had to, you know, I walked away from her computer and I just went, I, I'm not going to talk to anybody for an hour because I need to calm down. <laughs> But I just went, I can't, I'm sorry that you're having to spend the money to get a master's education. And this is, this is the material that's being presented to you. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. and, and she knew better with what she was having to do. She was like, well, I know what the answer that they want is. And so I'm going to give them the answer that they want. But this whole thing is, is not what we should be doing in the classroom. And, you know, so we both calmed down and talked about it later. <laughs> it's insulting and demoralizing, and it keeps brighter people from wanting to be in education. Yes. Um, and, and also, and just your average teacher, our experience, back to letters, letters is fairly rigorous. Yes. Um, and... Uh, we people say, why didn't anyone teach me these things before? That's almost universal. Uh, and then they say, it's hard, but I like the rigor. Mm -hmm. I like being asked to think hard. I like being challenged. Mm -hmm. I like having to go back and reread to pass the quiz because mm -hmm. it's forcing me to think and understand. So thank heavens for that. Yeah credit to our teachers. And I think that, um, you know, we need to honor our teachers by giving them meaningful training for heaven's sake, you know. 
and our, you know, and the teachers need it so that they can serve our children and yeah. save us from this literacy crisis that we're actively in. You know, I, I remember seeing a debate once people were like, what literacy crisis? And it's like, I don't know how you can deny a literacy crisis at this point in this no, country. They don't read. Yeah. So I'm going to respect your time. We've already gone over an hour and I am so grateful that you were willing to do this session with me today. Um, hope I've controlled my fangirl response to <laughs> being able to talk to you today <laughs> it's been a lot of fun Ashley I'm probably uh I don't know poking a few bears with my outspokenness but that's all right I'm all about poking bears so if you ever want to poke some more bears give me a ping and I'll definitely <laughs> let you poke as many bears as you want because at the end of the day you know as a parent you know what's frustrating to me is we were able to provide our son with what he needed and ongoing what he needs, but that was private investment. And I'm not ashamed to say we spent $65,000 in four years. Oh, yeah. That's, that's wrong, but we are privileged enough. My little family is privileged enough that we could do that. There's not a whole lot of families that can do that for their children. So what about the rest of the kids? We need to change the system in order to save all of our children, because I'm just afraid we're going to end up in this haves and have nots where the haves can read and write and the have nots, they're just gonna get left further and further and further behind. Mm -hmm. And that's not what education is supposed to be about. Right. So Absolutely right. That's why I'm, I'm not afraid to poke some bears, so. Okay, all right. <laughs> Thank you again so much. This has been a, this has been amazing and I'm just so grateful for you. Thank you, Ashley. Carry on. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.